Thanks, Jeff. It's a privilege to be back at the gathering. This is actually our third time, and uh, Cheryl and I genuinely love coming out this way. And uh, I've got to wonder why you're here this morning. I get it when you're new to a place. The first time I was here, you might have been like, well, let's go check this guy out. The second time, you were like, I guess we'll give him a second chance. Why are you here this morning? Uh, hopefully it's to, to gather together, to be encouraged, to be challenged, and it's certainly our privilege to be a part of that. And it, I've got to say this, it's a beautiful drive from Camp Crossroads to Ottawa. And if it feels like it's far away, it's not as far as Iowa. I'm sure the camp's closer than Camp Crossroads, but as Jeff said, we'd love to see you involved in, in any Christian camp because we feel that that is just such a significant way of connecting with God and, and being discipled and encouraged in, in faith that uh, we just want to see that happen. I was talking to Jeff Friesen, the director from Camp Iowa this week, and just we were agreeing together, this is not about competing in any way, shape, or form, but just giving you an opportunity to plug into what God is doing through camping ministry, and so hopefully you'll take the opportunity to do that to even check into it this morning. Quick question to start with. Um, we're going to focus in on the whole idea of, of our words and the language that we use. Who do you think speaks more words in a typical day? A man, a male, or a female? There are studies that have been done on this, by the way, so I'm not going to make up statistics here. Who, who do you think says more words in a given day? Male or female? Just shout it out. Is this... Anybody disagree with that? Anybody say males speak more than females? Well, a more recent study has proven that they're very similar. Males and females actually speak about the same. Because traditionally growing up, I, I thought there was a huge disparity between the two. You know, that something like 20,000 words for a female and about 13,000 words. About more recent study shows that that's not the case at all. Uh, here it is, actually, if you're interested. If you're into statistics, women speak about 16,000 words on average and men 15,000. So ladies, don't start celebrating just yet. The study did find out, and this is kind of a conviction point here, so I'll let you deal with that. This is between you and God. But ladies will tend to gossip more. They'll talk about other people more than guys will, because guys will talk about the game last night, or the car, or the project they're working on. So there is a difference in the kinds of words that are spoken within those numbers of words that males and females speak. So. Think about that for just a moment and kind of do the inventory in your own life. How many of you speak a second language? Okay, how, is it French for the most part? An interesting study uh, published in The Economist says that if you learn a second language, you will gain economically. In fact, up to $125,000 in increased earning power. That's pretty significant. I guess it's not surprising, but what did surprise me about that study is that the language that will earn you the most, that will pay back the most, uh, caught me off guard. What do you think it is? I would have thought so as well. Mandarin or Cantonese, one of those. German. Anybody here speak German as a second language? Ich kann ein bisschen Deutsch sprechen, ja. Heute ist ein schöner Tag und wir sind zusammen zum Gottesdienst, für Gottesdienst. That'll cost you about 15 bucks. <laughs> Figure, what do, you, what do you think, Liam? Pretty close? That's good, yeah. So, learn a second language. I, I happen to know just enough to get myself into trouble. You can ask Liam what I just said later on, and he'll probably give you a discount on that. But anyway, language is obviously an important thing, whether it's we're measuring the number of words that we speak or what we're talking about. And uh, some of us have enough trouble with one language. We probably shouldn't learn a second one. But uh, I don't know how many words I'm going to say in the space of the next 30 minutes or so, but probably a significant number. Uh, my hope is that you remember one. That somehow God speaks into your heart that one word that will shape and change just the flow of your life in a slightly different direction. That he'll encourage and strengthen you in that. So 
Hang on to just that one word if you can this morning and uh, we'll see what, what God wants to do in that. As I was thinking about the, uh, the series that Jeff had concluded and then you did a kind of a one-off on, on discipleship and spiritual growth and I don't like to just parachute in and do the Paulist message, message that I've done 50 times before. I intentionally want to be growing and learning and so I prepare for the, the services that I'm a part of in various churches and so I was convicted in this area very recently myself as Cheryl and I visited visited a church and had an opportunity to hear the pastor at that church speaking and he, he touched on this topic and I walked out of there challenged and I thought, you know what, why not share out of what I'm being challenged in myself and the whole area of the words that we speak, the language that you, we use and sure it can go beyond just the, the specific spoken verbal words. Sometimes we think of stuff that we've put out there in other ways like Twitter or Facebook and we wish we could take it back but certainly language is a powerful thing and there's no doubt about how our words can impact other people and so um as I was thinking about this and reflecting and digging into scripture on it, I was amazed again, and I knew it, but I'd kind of forgotten it over time, how much the Bible actually has to say on this subject of the words that we speak. And if there's a strong warning throughout scripture to measure and to weigh and to be intentional about the language that we use. In fact, I want to go with you to the letter that James wrote. It's towards the end of the, uh, the New Testament. And to just read from James chapter 3 um, regarding the use of words. Uh, any, are there like pew Bibles here? or uh, Okay, so if you can find it, take the time, go to the table of contents, make sure you can follow along. If you've got your phone, it'll be easier to find on there, I'm sure. But we want to just spend a little bit of time reflecting on James chapter 3 that starts out in this way. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And I have been in the role of a teacher. I was a teacher by profession starting out in my career. And it's, it is a place of uh, honor, but it's also a place of accountability. So when I think of standing up here this morning or when Jeff or anyone gets up to, to lead or to speak, that's a place of honor, but it's also a place of high accountability. And part of me would just like to get off stage right now. Because that's the standard. There's a standard that uh, teachers are being held to. Now you may laugh at that, but think of yourself in the role of a parent or somebody in a place of authority over someone else. You're in a place of teaching. And most of us end up in that place at some point in the week or uh, in our lives for sure. Um, so there's, there's that humbling aspect to it. It says we all stumble in many ways. Anybody agree with that? <laughs> My life is stumbling from one thing to the next, it seems. And anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow, that strong language. So here you've got James writing saying, caution if you're in a position of teaching or in that role, be careful what you say. And so I'm sure that in his own mind, as he's writing these words, he's conscious of the fact that his words have power and he's going to be held to account for them. And yet he goes on to, to use such graphic language that, uh, that our words and our tongue are set on fire by hell itself. <laughs> wow. This is sobering. This is something that, that we should be considering uh, carefully. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Wow. When we think of our own journey, our spiritual growth, should our language, the words that we use, the way that we speak, be transformed as part of that spiritual journey? I think the answer is fairly obvious. Yes, it should be. There should be a transformation that takes place. The tongue speaking words unleashes power. I know we say they're only words, and you probably heard that expression or the old sticks and stones. 
may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And we know that that's not true. And so anybody singing a song when they see their only words? Is there a song going through your mind right now? Wasn't there a song like in the 70s? Okay, I'm dating myself. Who sang that? No. The Bee Gees there. I don't want to talk about that, but <laughs> I was afraid that might happen. Hopefully that, that isn't where you end up. But, but that expression, there are only words you've probably heard in other forms as well. And we, we can say that to justify, oh, I didn't mean it. You know, get over it. That's there. No, but our words are powerful. They are powerful. They're powerful in the usual sense that just the spoken word can hurt someone's feelings. And we know that we've all done that. I'm sure we've all been guilty of that. And th there are some words that are more powerful than others. So I was intrigued by this idea. Are there some words in the language, in the English language, that are identified as being more powerful than others? And so I've uh, got a few here. Anybody want to guess what some of the more powerful words in the English language are? Is it okay to ask people to guess in this church? Be comfortable with it? I guess I already did, so deal with it. They're only words. Guess. Awesome. Awesome. We use it a lot, don't we? And when you think of the connotation of that, it's certainly true. Sorry, didn't make the list. At least not. I googled it and then I double checked it to make sure it wasn't just some random guy making up stuff. Good. Good. Yeah, you'd, you'd hope so. Here they are. I'll give them to you. You. Y O U is one of the most powerful words. And copywriters will, and that is connected to a person's name, which you probably would have guessed. People value hearing, the, and, and there's a reason for me sharing these with you. And it's, it's that personal connection that people are looking for. Here's another one, free. Free. Whether it's gluten free or free for you. It's just a powerful word that, that they use in associating some positive connotations and there were some studies done to actually verify this. Here's another one that kind of caught me off guard, because when you give the, uh, the person listening the reason for what you're talking about, they're much more likely to connect with what you're saying, because. So to include that in the language that we use is, is a powerful thing. Here's another one, and this is no surprise at all in our culture, instantly, instantly. We want immediate gratification. Does that surprise you? Any of those words catch you off guard? But I, as I thought about the deeper implications of that as well, the whole idea that it's personal, we all want that. We long for that. That sense of being recognized. That it's free. And, and I made connections right away with the gospel message. That it is a personal message that God has for each one of us. That there's a sense that it is given to us freely, even though it costs everything. And there's a reason God is working this out. And there's a purpose to it as well. And our lives have purpose. And so I thought, wow, it's no surprise on a deeper level then that's, that these words do resonate with us. As we look through the biblical account, we see that words are powerful. They really are powerful. Sure, they're only words, but if you go right back to the beginning of the account of Scripture, the account of creation, in the beginning was the, uh, no, I'm sorry, that's the Gospel of John, but in the beginning was the earth formless and void, and what happens? God says, let there be. Again and again, he says, he speaks words, and that's the creative force that brings everything into a being. As I mentioned, the uh, Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The idea of the Logos, the Word, is a powerful thing. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Again, it's the Word. And so throughout Scripture, we find that again and again. The gospel, the way it's communicated, the way it's brought to us, the way we receive it is in the vehicle, the packaging, the, the conveyance of words revealed to us by word. We hear the gospel, we respond to the gospel, we share the gospel. And so it's no wonder the vehicle of language should be guarded and protected it should be transformed. It should be made new as we grow spiritually. Um, I almost hate to admit this publicly, but I'm a corner gas fan. The old Canadian Saskatchewan sitcom. And there's one episode that just cracked us up. We actually own the whole series. That's, ju don't judge us. But we were watching one episode where Hank, if you know the series, and Wanda's 
vehicles. They swap them through the police taking possession and auction. It's all goofy anyway, but they end up in each other's vehicles and Wanda put these pink stickers all over Hank's truck and Hank was driving her little car and threatened to haul manure in it. A vehicle would be <laughs> changed forever if you hauled manure in it and our language can be like that and it kind of struck me that yeah our language is the vehicle in which we can affirm and encourage and support and communicate the gospel or it can also be the language that carries manure. Right? It can be that vehicle in which we damage people or make life stink for them. And so there's, yeah, they're only words, but they are powerful. And they can reveal so much about what's going on in here. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, when Isaiah the prophet has a vision of God, he responds in an interesting way. He sees God fill the temple and, and there's, there's a power that, that just fills that place. And his response is interesting. He says, woe to me. I cried, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips. Of all of the things that he could have said in that moment, he goes to the fact that he's a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So when he confronts the reality of who God is, it's his mouth, that conveyance of uh, thought language, communication that he centers in on as that point of conviction, saying, God, I need you to work in my life. Why the lips and not the hands, not the heart, not the mind? Maybe those are more powerfully sim symbolic, but it's so, it's so practical, the way that we speak. In fact, you can see it in a young child. I've seen it played out in our own kids' lives. I've seen it played out more often in other people's kids' lives. When they reach that point where they look at the parent or the person in authority and say, no, you know something's happened in here. What happened to that sweet little innocent child to where they put their hands on their hips and maybe stomp their feet and say no. And you know that rebellion has taken root and it's actually being, uh, it's showing up in what they say. It's revealed in what they say. Um, words can be such a reflection of what's going on. They reveal so much about what's in here. And I'm convicted by that personally. I know that I can so easily default to being critical. And I find that even, you know, when I'm saying things, I'll be driving along and I'll say something. It's like, where did that come from? Why am I judging? Why am I being critical in that way? And, and I can justify it a thousand different ways. I just have discerning taste. That's all. I have higher standards. Like, I can justify it. I, but it's not true. I'm, I'm just critical. And the words that I speak reflect that critical attitude in me. And I need to take stock of the words that I say and then do that gut check to say, I need to be changed in my attitude. I need to be transformed in the way that I think. Now, that's a deep work. It's a deep work. In fact, uh, as we go back to that section in James chapter 3, he says there, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships and turn them with a small rudder. He says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on uh, this path of destruction. But it's impossible to tame. He says, if you can tame the tongue, you're perfect. And I don't think any of us in our more lucid moments would admit or say that we're perfect. I know I'm not. So it tells me that this is a deeper work than just slipping a, a bit into a horse's mouth. This isn't about behavior management. This is about transformation. This isn't about learning a new way of speaking the way we'd learn a new language. This is about the heart being changed so that the overflow of the heart is different. I think the best way to measure somebody's spiritual growth would be to be there when they hit their thumb with a hammer. You can't fake it. And same way parenting, it's in that moment where the kid does exactly what you don't want them to do, that boom, there it is. And it comes out of here. Doesn't, and I'm not saying there isn't a place for saying that stern word, but just that gut level response where you see it come out like toothpaste out of the tube and there's no way of calling it back. And then you know, wow, there's more work to be done right in here. God, I need you to work 
in me. So hopefully as you think about that, you're, you're recognizing that this isn't just about learning a new way of speaking. This is about being transformed. And this is why the psalmist in Psalm 19 says, uh, Psalm 19 verse 14 says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O God. Because those two are so closely connected. They, they are tied together. They are so tied together. Um, the Apostle Paul gives such clear direction about this in Ephesians chapter 5. Again, some really practical teaching, and I'm, uh, I'm visiting a few different sections just to remind us that, that when we talk about the, the whole counsel, the, what Scripture teaches, it's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament, it's in the, the teachings of Jesus, it's in the teachings of the Apostle Paul, it's, it's in the letter to James, like really practical application of life transformation kind of stuff. And he says, but among you there must not be even a hint not even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because they, these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. So very quickly he moves from what's in here to the way it finds expression in the way that we talk. No immoral or impure or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. So there's this, again, this standard being set. There's this call to a higher standard, to, to transformation, to a different way of living and a different way of speaking. So if learning German can be worth $125,000 in the lifetime of, of a person's career, of how much greater value is it to learn to be different in the way that we speak because we're different in the way that we are, right? That the economy of that is of far greater value than just dollars and cents. That it'll change our lives and it can change the lives of the people around us. See, the words we speak reveal so much about us, but they also have huge potential, redemptive potential for us and for, for those that we speak to. It would be a life-changing journey for us individually and for our communities. And I want to live with greater intentionality in this area. I want to be more specific about what I say, and even in the way that I say it, to grow in this as a disciple in an all-in sort of way. Um, James, again, going back to James chapter 3, talks about this. He says, with the tongue... We praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. And I'm amazed at that as I think about it, standing there, singing. I'm no great singer, but basically saying the words and trying to make them sound musical. I'm praising God, and there's a lot of meaning. And I really appreciated the songs uh, that were chosen for this morning. There's a lot of meaning in that, and I can communicate that. But it's so easy for me to turn around and use the same vehicle of language to to curse human beings and to judge them and to say disparaging things about them. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt spring produce fresh water. The overflow of the heart that God's presence in us should be a spring that is life-giving, the living water that is Jesus flowing out of us. And so words have the potential for ushering in new understanding, new reality. I love that biblical principle of blessing. And you see that played out again and again in the Old Testament, where uh, Jacob will bless his children. And I wonder, would there be a time for us to do that? Should we revisit that and dig into that and see what that looks like? The power of speaking words over our children that are intentionally words of blessing. That, that just kind of laying a landscape before them of what could be. Cheryl and I were quite particular about the naming of our kids because we wanted them to live into that, that destiny, that sense of, of God's greatness in, in their lives. And, and what about blessing. Cheryl, we had the chance to, to travel with our kids who are 26 and 24, and we spent a week together in, uh, in uh, Mexico. 
Don't judge us, we needed a break. But it was just great to be there. And Cheryl said, we should be somewhere with palm trees on Palm Sunday, but that's not working out for us. We're in Ottawa. <laughs> but anyway, we were there and we attended a, a, a church service. And I just appreciated how the pastor kind of partway through the service said, now what we're going to do is we're going to take a time for you as parents to just bless your kids. And take a time of prayer where we did that together. And I, as a Christian parent involved in ministry, had to think, when was the last time, I, the last time I've done this? To intentionally go over to my kids and just bless them. Words. The potential. It's huge. Redemptive potential. It's huge. So that they even hear us. I know we, we pray for them regularly, daily. But for them to hear us doing that. So it can be an opportunity to bless the redemptive potential is huge. It ushers in a new reality. In fact, uh, going back to the Ephesians text that I referenced before, in Ephesians 4, uh, Paul says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but, and this is where he holds out what ought to be, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So think of the conversations that we're a part of, whether it's around the, the water cooler at work where people are standing around just kind of bantering and conversations can, can ebb and flow, but we can be a determining influence on where it ebbs and flows. Because I've been in that setting where, you know, suddenly the guy's like, hey, have you heard the one about? And I know where this is going. And do I lean into that? Or can I redemptively redirect that? Do I contribute to it? Or do I bring in that, that seasoning, that flavoring that takes it in a different direction? And I'm, I'm impressed with how Paul puts it, this. He says that it may benefit those who listen. And I had to think not only those people that are, you know, directly involved in the conversation, but also those that happen to overhear it. And I had to replay the tape in my mind where I've been caught in having a conversation when our kids were younger more particularly and suddenly realized, oh, they're listening. They're listening. And our kids do. And is our conversation uh, flavored in such a way that it will benefit even them? You know, on the phone and we're chatting and not judging anybody, but gossiping and the kids, and we, know, we now know statistically women are more prone to do this, right? And the kids are listening. Men, we get there. We get there as well. Benefit those that listen. Wow. What a, what a high standard. The redemptive potential is great. Uh, James, the text again that we're, we're hovering around, starts out the teaching. There's a high standard there. Some of us probably need to do a reboot in our lives. We kind of need to say, stop, I, I, know, I know I need to change in this area. We can't do it in our own strength. This is not behavior management. This is transformation. And that's why I'm so encouraged that again, it comes back to the simplicity of language. There's such power in simply saying, please forgive me. Please forgive me. When was the last time you heard that expression? Jeff mentioned the fact that uh, we worked together in high school. I was there for about 13 years. And I was caught one day because um, I was struck by the fact that uh, a student was misbehaving. They were clearly in the wrong. And, and part of my job was I had to call them on it. So I did. I called them on. And their immediate response was, I'm sorry. And then I had to start thinking about how often I hear people respond with an I'm sorry. But... There's a difference between please forgive me and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that people are starving in Africa this morning. I regret that fact. But I can't say please forgive me for the fact that people are starving. Do you see how I'm sorry is about my emotional state, whereas please forgive me reflects the fact that I owe you a debt and I need you to release that, release me from that debt. So I'm wondering if our language could be tweaked even in that area. So when your kids say, I'm sorry, say, that's great. I'm glad you feel that remorse. But there's more going on here than just that. When we wrong somebody, are we willing to actually use the language that conveys that? When we think of our relationship with God, are we willing to admit that we need to be transformed and we need him to do the work in us? See, I find culturally we go very quickly to I'm sorry, which still is very selfish because it's about how I feel. It's not about what I owe you. 
See the difference? And there's a humbling in that. When I say, please forgive me, I'm now on, at your mercy. And I'm looking for you to release me for the wrong that I've done you. So, yeah, language can betray, can reveal so much. But there's so much redemptive potential in that. The words, please forgive me, when acted upon, suddenly change a relationship. Suddenly there's a transformation that takes place and there's, a, there's really a mutual humbling. I'm saying I owe you a debt and you're humbled in saying it's gone. And so it's a beautiful new day dawning in our relationship. See, I'm sorry for the conflict in the Middle East, but at this time it's not my fault. See, I couldn't say please forgive me for the conflict in the Middle East because I didn't do it. So maybe we need to look at the language we use even in and the potential is great if we do that. There's another aspect in which language is so much potential. Romans chapter 10, the uh, author writes, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So all in discipleship begins with that recognition that Jesus is Lord and declaring that. So today's Palm Sunday. The weekend we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem where people lined the streets waving their palm branches and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Now that's a very specific word that they're saying there and it appears once in the Old Testament, one other location in the Old Testament. And it's a declaration that we need you to save us, God. God, save us might be a way to translate that. It's a declaration, it's a cry for help. You know, today is Palm Sunday. We all need a Palm Sunday in our own personal lives. We all need to come to that place where we say, God, I need your help. I need your help. And that's, that's got huge potential to say that and to recognize that and to declare it. I want to leave you with a really practical challenge this morning. Um, it comes out of that message that I heard. And it's really um, the, the speaker, and this is the one thing that I'm kind of really taking from, from his message. So, Actually, he's got it from the Bible, so we'll give the Bible credit. It's Psalm 141, verse 3. And actually, I'd encourage you to go there and mark it in, in your Bibles if, if you feel the freedom to do that. It says this, Set a guard over my mouth. And it's a prayer. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So even in saying those words, we recognize, I can try to change my behavior, but what I need is a change of heart, and I need you to do it, God. Set a guard over my mouth, O oh Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And this is, uh, pastor encouraged us to, to memorize it, and I've been doing that, just kind of revisiting that daily, just reminding myself what comes out of here has huge redemptive potential. But also the other side of it is it can do a lot of damage. So... May God do that in us as we continue to press in to be more like Jesus who spoke truth. He was full of grace and truth and blessed people. And we have the potential of being part of what God wants to do through us. So, yeah. Thank you, Ed, for bringing the word this morning. Why don't we give Ed a round of applause and just say thank you. Right. Appreciate it. Um,